Chapter 8 Your Majesty! Willow gasped. Sundu found herself bowing her head instinctively, and she quickly jerked it back up again. She was a true leafwing, or a poison wing, as the saplings called them. And more important, she was Sundu, and she bowed to nobody. Queen Sequoia smiled faintly. You have exactly your grandmother's stubborn expression. I saw it many times during the tree wars. My grandmother? Sundu echoed, surprised. She'd heard of her, of course, all the time, but she died before Sundu hatched. She was my best general, Sequoia sighed. And my most loyal, until I finally gave her an order she couldn't follow. Give up and run away. That's when she left me and started your group instead. She turned, offhandedly sweeping a noisy toad into the pond with one talon, where it sank with a startled glorp. Come, we will be safer in the village. I shouldn't. I should turn and run home. Belladonna will lose her mind if she discovered I've run to the saplings to tell tales on her. She wasn't sure whether it was the idea of Belladonna's apoplectic face or the air of authority around Queen Sequoia, but she found herself following the queen with Willow by her side. Did you tell her about me? Sundu hissed at Willow. Did you bring her here? Sundu. Willow said patiently, in the tone of a teacher reminding her students that three plus three always equals six. I wouldn't do that, and you know it. She did sort of know it, but there was a part of her that was still mad that she'd been caught like this, and she wanted someone to blame. Sundu scowled. I can blame Queen Sequoia. What was she doing spying on us? How dare she? I will definitely tell her how I feel about that in as mad of a voice as I like. I don't have to treat her like a queen. I can yell at her if I want to. Maybe not right this second. Maybe later. When I feel like it. Don't be scared. Willow whispered. I'm not scared. Sundu snapped, loud enough for the queen to glance over her shoulder at them. She lowered her voice. When am I ever scared? What do I have to be scared of? She's just a big dragon. She doesn't even have an army. I'm not scared! Willow stopped and took one of Sundu's talons. In the dark, Sundu felt the smooth, familiar weight of the jade frog come to rest in her palm. She tucked it back into her pouch, brushed her wing along Willow's, and felt her heart rate start to calm down. I'm sorry she followed me, but I'm not sorry you're coming to the village. Willow said, starting to walk again. There's something I can't wait to show you. You did say you had something to tell me. Sundu remembered sheepishly. What is it? I mean, I think it's exciting. Willow said. Maybe not as much to you. After all, you're almost dying and a war is starting. But guess what? There are strangers in our village. Two of them. And you'll never believe where two of them come from. It's amazing. Wait until you see them. Is one of them a silkwing? Sundu asked. One of the silkwings I brought to the rainforest is looking for his sister. She stopped herself just in time from adding, And our spies thought you might have her. She was quite sure that Queen Sequoia was listening to them, even though she was several steps ahead. Actually, yes, the third one is a sibling, Willow said. Aw, I hope we can unite them. Sundu flicked her wings, surprised and pleased. What were the chances that Luna would have blown ashore here, and survived and been rescued by the sapwings before Sundu's tribe mates or the dragon traps or the cobra lilies or the snakes got her? That would solve a few problems, if we could give Luna to Belladonna instead of Blue. A willing flame silk ally would be a much better bargain than hostages that have to be coerced into helping us. Then Blue and Cricket could do whatever they want to do next, and if they don't want to be my friends anymore, that's just fine. But first, Sequoia would have to agree to give up Luna. What if she has her own plans using flame silk? And the other two? She asked. You'll see. Willow flashed her an unmistakable grin, sparkling even in the darkness under the trees. Sundu felt a funny shiver in her chest, as though her heart had shaken raindrops off its wings. Even after everything I just told her, even though she thinks I've endangered her tribe and restarted a war she doesn't want, she still loves me. In Sundu's life, love mostly came in the form of yelling and criticism and judgment. Her parents loved her, and showed it by telling her everything she did wrong correcting her mistakes and starting shouting matches whenever they were the slightest bit aggravated. It still confused her sometimes when Willow did none of that. It was confusing her right now. Wasn't Willow angry at her? She'd never seen Willow get angry. It was kind of unsettling, honestly. 
Sundu had thought about it for years and eventually came to the conclusion that Willow must just hide her anger really well. But did that mean it would erupt one day, all of a sudden, and burn down their relationship? These were the things Sundu worried about at night. She'd expected to find a wall or barrier or fence like the one she'd built around her own village, but instead the sapwing village crept up around them, like termites. The first sign was that all the dragon traps disappeared. Sundu had never walked through a stretch of jungle with no dragon traps in it. Nor, she realized, were there any sundews, or pitcher plants, or anything else that ate dragons. Sundu was looking so carefully for carnivorous plants that she missed the first few leaf houses, but then they were overhead, and it was dark. Suddenly she noticed a cluster of phosphorescent moss in a tree up ahead, and as they approached, she realized it lit up the interior of a kind of leaf-globe treehouse, perched in the higher branches. Whoa. She said, stopping without realizing it. Willow nudged her forward again, and then Sundu spotted more and more of them. The trees were full of the leaf houses, not so different from the nests in her village, except they were in the sky, covered in leaves, and much bigger than her own. She guessed each would fit at least six dragons comfortably, at least of the ones she saw. Now she heard voices, too, here and there the murmur of dragons talking, and not far away, someone singing a lullaby. She heard a dragonette chirping and his parents sending him back to bed. She heard the soft rustle of dragons leaping from tree to tree, possibly tracking the queen's movements. And mine, she guessed, her claws curling into the dirt. They leaped into the air and led her to the largest treehouse of all, a structure that spiraled all the way around an enormous baobab, with several levels, balconies, and rooms built out along the massive branches. Sundu couldn't see all of it in the dark, but from the night blooms that were lit up in a few rooms, she was able to see dark purple and red clematis vines twining all around the columns and bright red trumpet creepers dangling from the ceilings. They landed in a room on the top level with a smooth, polished wood floor that must have taken a lot of work to make so slippery and shiny. A young leafwing was waiting for them, curled on a mahogany throne, sewing sheets of speckled paper together to make a book. She looked a little older than Sundu, with large brown eyes and deft dark green claws. Hazel, Queen Sequoia said reprovingly as the dragon looked up. What have I told you about bookmaking at night? It's... Inefficient use of my time? Hazel guessed with a mischievous grin. You will ruin your eyes. The queen tugged the pages out of her talons as Hazel protested. And then we'll either have to steal glasses from the hive wings or have a blind queen. And I don't like either of those plans. Sundu gave Willow a startled look. That's the queen's great-granddaughter. Willow whispered. Princess Hazel, next in line for the throne. Oh, right. Willow had mentioned Hazel a few times, mostly in the context of why Queen Sequoia refused to restart the Tree Wars. Something about not wanting to lose any more dragons. I think glasses are cute, Hazel said breezily. And we won't have to steal them if the scouts are right about the poison wings capturing a real flame silk today. Hazel, the queen said in a warning tone. This is Sandu, Belladonna's daughter. Hazel's jaw dropped. She stared at Sundu for a long, awestruck moment. That's how you were supposed to react when you met me. Sundu whispered to Willow. <gasps> the Sundu? Willow gasped, widening her eyes theatrically. The one and only Sundu? The one who almost slew the great and terrible grasshopper stealing frog manners of the jungle? <laughs> Sundu bopped her on the nose with her tail, and Willow dissolved in giggles. Am I allowed to say hi? Hazel asked her great-grandmother. Yes, of course, Queen Sequoia said, a little impatiently. Especially if it gets you off my throne, go on. Chairs are for old dragon bones, not bendy little saplings like you. Hazel bounded off the throne and skidded across the floor to Sundu's feet. Hello, I'm Hazel. Sorry, you know that. I hear about you all the time. Belladonna thinks you should be queen instead of me. Do you think so too? She's so scary. Sorry, I know she's your mom. Ah, I'm saying all the wrong things. She drew herself up and did a rather impressive imitation of Queen Sequoia's regal expression. Even her voice went hilariously fancy. 
Welcome to the Leafwing Village. We are delighted you could join us. Tea? Oh, you don't have to be Queen Face Hazel for Sandu, Willow said. Yes, she does. Queen Sequoia called just as Hazel was starting to relax her wings. She snapped them back into elegant arches immediately. It's good practice. And none of us know Belladonna's daughter as well as you apparently do, Willow. Oh, I... we met... um... Willow stammered. By accident, Sundu said. It was my fault. Not that we have anything to apologize for. Whoever said we couldn't know each other? I mean, that would be a stupid rule. I believe that is Belladonna's rule, Sequoia said, rubbing her forehead. Isn't it? No fraternizing between poison wings and leaf wings? We're not poison wings, Sundu snapped. And even if it is her rule, it's still stupid, and she didn't even make it until after I met Willow, and she can't tell me what to do or who to like anyway. It's none of her business. It's a little bit her business, Sequoia pointed out. As both your mother and commander, but I'm not actually remotely interested in you and Willow, or how you met, or why she's been sneaking out and staring wistfully at an empty pond for the last several nights. She pointed one long claw at Sundu. I heard you say something about a book, a flame silk, and a burned hive. The full story now. Sundu didn't have to tell her. Technically, this wasn't her queen if the tribe had officially split in two. But then again, if she had to choose between obeying this queen or following her mother's orders, she kind of liked the idea of choosing this one. And she did need help identifying the vine if she was still following Cricket's daft plan of trying to unbrainwash the hive wings. Plus, it would make Belladonna so mad, and she fully deserved it. So Sundu told the queen everything, the whole story about leaving the jungle, hiding in the greenhouse, meeting Blue and Cricket, stealing the book, rescuing Blue, sneaking into Jewel Hive, finding the chrysalis, spreading the truth about the mind control and the book, Cricket kidnapping an egg for some reason, escaping, figuring out that the mind control was connected to a plant, watching Bloodworm Hive burn from a distance, and then taking advantage of the tribe's distraction to burn down Wasp's greenhouse of mind control plants. And then we came home. She finished. And nobody followed us and everything is fine. Mission accomplished. All good! Vengeance on track. The queen leaned back into her throne with a weary expression. Sundu wondered how old she was. As old as she looked? The tree wars were only fifty years ago, and she'd been a young queen when Wasp tried to steal her power and usurp her tribe, if Sundu remembered her history correctly. I can't believe Belladonna did it, Queen Sequoia said in a thin voice. After all our conversations, after everything I've said to her, her mother was so loyal, but that viper. She snapped her jaw shut suddenly and took a deep breath through her nostrils. Great-grandmother? Hazel said. Do not talk to me, I'm calming down. Sequoia barked. The three younger leafwings looked at one another, then back to the queen. Sequoia was staring so hard at a knot on the end of her throne that Sundu thought it might burst into flames. She kept breathing in and out, extremely loudly, through her nose. Are you- Hazel started. No, I am not. Shush. Sequoia growled. Hazel sighed. This could take a minute. She whispered to Sundu. Does this happen a lot? Sundu whispered back. Only when she's really mad. Usually she can squash it pretty well without this whole theatrical interlude. I can still hear you! Sequoia thumped the side of her throne with her tail. I am trying to count until I feel calmer and less like murdering everyone! Sundu tilted her head at the queen. Count? She echoed, glancing at Willow. That's why all her meetings with Belladonna take so long. Hazel joked. Because she has to take deep breaths and count to calm herself down after everything your mom says. Or else she might end up strangling her. She should try, Sundu said. Why doesn't she just yell at her? Or us? Willow gave her an alarmed look. I don't want her to yell at us. But then maybe she'll feel better. Sundu pointed out. Well, I wouldn't, Willow said. I'd feel awful, and I bet she would too. Does yelling make you feel better? It's only ever made me feel worse. Oh my goodness, 
Sandu said. I must hear every story about you yelling at someone right this minute. Willow scrunched her nose at her. I was very little. It was only once, and I still feel guilty about it. Well, I'm sure they deserved it. Sandu said loyally. Great-grandmother tries very hard not to yell at her subjects. Hazel said in her queen face voice. She was a more impulsive, angry dragon back during the Tree Wars. And she has come to believe it got several of her subjects killed. She had made an effort to become a wiser, calmer ruler. Thanks in the large part to the implementation of the counting to ten strategy. She must be past ten by now. Sandu said. I could have counted to nine hundred in this time. Not with a trio of aggravating twigs chattering like magpies in the background. Queen Sequoia interjected sternly. She took another deep breath. I am calm. Everything is fine. I just want to say... Sundu blurted. That I, for one, am very glad you were an angry dragon when the tree wars started. Because it meant you fought back against Wasp's power grab and didn't just roll over her like Monarch did. I'm glad you fought for a tribe and protected us from her. I would hate for the leaf wings to be stuck where the spineless silk wings are right now. So thank you for being a mad dragon, and I say keep it up and let's go fight some more! The queen gazed down at her for a long moment, and then a flicker of a smile crossed her face. I think Belladonna made a mistake leaving you out of our meetings for all this time, she said. You're considerably much more persuasive than she is. Sundu fluffed up the frill along her spine and beamed. Take that, Belladonna. I knew I should have been invited. Just like I've been saying. But no, said Queen Sequoia. Sundu deflated as she went on. My leaf wings are not getting involved in another war. Do we have a choice? Willow asked. Won't Was come after all of us now? After what happened to Bloodworm Hive? I suspect she'll be even angrier about her greenhouse than the hive. Sequoia said thoughtfully. Especially if that was her only supply of this mystery plant, and she needs it to control her tribe. Let me see that vine. Sundu pulled out the cutting, which was looking a little the worse for wear after going in and out of her pouch several times. She stepped forward and draped it over Sequoia's outstretched talons. Something happened to the queen's face. It was fast and hard to catch in the dim phosphorescent light, but Sundu thought she saw recognition and horror flash through the queen's eyes. Her claws closed around the vine compulsively, crushing it slightly, and then she released it again and took another deep breath. You know it, Sundu said. You've seen this vine before. I'm not sure, Sequoia said. She rose abruptly to her feet. I need to consult my books. Go away and come back after dawn, all three of you, she added with a stern look at Hazel. Sundu kind of wanted to ask for the vine back, but she had a pretty strong feeling the queen would say no, and then what would she do? Try to wrestle it out of the massive dragon's talons? I'll get the truth out of her when we come back, though. She thought as they all took a step back toward the edge of the balcony. She definitely knows this plant. Can it take Sandu to meet the new dragons? Willow asked. Yes, yes. The queen answered, waving them off. They're asleep, you nut. Hazel pointed out with a grin at Willow that made Sandu absolutely wild with jealousy. Can we just speak at them? Willow said. Come on, Sandu. The new dragons, it turned out, were only a few levels down the same tree, in two side-by-side -side interior rooms that Sundu noticed were not prison cells, exactly, but were not exactly wide open to the rest of the village, either. She also couldn't help but notice the vines of thorns and toxic sap that wound around the doorways, or the four leaf wings stationed nearby, casually playing pick-up twigs in the hall in the middle of the night. They gave Willow and Sundu suspicious looks, but went back to their game with a shrug when they saw Hazel with them. The Silkwing isn't there, Willow whispered, pointing to the first doorway. Sundu peered inside, her heart thumping. This whole time, she'd felt confident that Luna was all right. Her sense of Luna, from the short time they'd been together, was that Luna could absolutely take care of herself. But Blue and Swordtail had worried so much and so incessantly that it must have rubbed off on her a little because now she felt a tremor of weird excitement as she peered into the dark room. Luna, at last! Safe and sound! So everyone could shut up about her and focus on the mission! Except, it wasn't Luna. She couldn't see the sleeping silkwing very clearly, but she could see that the wings were a dark color, maybe blue or purple, 
not the pale pearly green that Luna's were, and there was no flame silk glow from the silk wing's wrists. What's wrong? Willow said softly. Not that dragon we're looking for. Sundu shook her head with a sigh. Blue was going to be disappointed. Swordtail was going to be worse. He was going to be super annoying about it. But Luna had to be all right. She must have just landed somewhere else. Where did you find her? Chatina rode into Ura not far from the border, Willow said. She's lucky we got there before he hates her. I wonder what a silkwing was doing inside the poison jungle, Sandu said thoughtfully. He's keeping from the high wings, I think, Willow said. Now come see the others. She tugged on Sandu's elbow and led her to the second doorway. Sandu found herself holding her breath as she looked inside. For a moment, she didn't know what she was seeing. There were two dragons, asleep back to back with the bigger one's wing tented over the smaller one. The smaller one seemed to be greenish, like a leaf wing, but the wing she could see was an odd shape, not leaf-like at all. And the other dragon was... not green, maybe blue? Like a silk wing, but with only two wings? Strangest of all, they were both kind of glowing. She squinted at them. Yup, little patterns in their scales had a faint glow to them all along their wings and across their snouts and down their tails, as though they had rolled in phosphorescent moss, except it seemed to be really part of them. What are they? She breathed, awestruck. They call themselves sea wings, Willow whispered. And they come from the distant kingdoms. 